So, you know, one of the things that as we move forward and real breakthrough thinking is analytics. And I often find when I talk about analytics, people instantly think about reporting, right? That's not what I'm going to be talking about here today. I'm really talking about the evolution of analytics to do learning systems, to be able to answer questions you don't know to ask, to be able to redefine planning, to have in-memory analytics. And so I asked two people to come up. They're real-life applications of where they've built analytics teams. I'd like to ask Manny from Intel and Stephen from Snyder Electric to come on stage. And each of them are going to share their story of building analytics teams. And I've really asked them to think about two questions really hard to share with you. One is, how do you get analytics talents? And the second question is, how do you build a data-driven culture? So, Manny, I'm going to ask you to go first, if you don't mind. And if you want to just have a seat, and we'll have you go next, OK? Thanks, all right. Good afternoon. I think all of you had enough coffee, right? So we'll try to keep our discussion interesting. And Laura <laughs> will make sure it's going to be, you know, there will be some data that you're going to capture and analyze and tell us whether it's interesting or not at the end, right? So uh, Manny Janakiram uh, with Intel, and uh, I know some of you, and uh, I know that uh, some of you are already using a lot of data in your uh, supply chain, in your applications, and it's not just data, but uh, data to information to knowledge to wisdom is what we really care about. It's a journey. And uh, before we jump to it, I have a couple of slides. And uh, I know most of you here know about Intel, but uh, let's start with right there. Intel Corporation, the world's largest uh, semiconductor company. We have 100,000 employees. I'm not going to read everything. It's, it's there, right? Uh, again, if I just throw all data at you, it's boring. So I'm, I'm going to give you tidbits, right? So rank number 42 in Fortune's uh, world most admired companies. I'm proud to be part of Intel for the last 15 years. And uh, we also make a big difference in terms of our uh, you know, vision and everything. So from here, I'm here to talk about the analytics and supply chain. So let's first go understand what exactly is Intel's supply chain. I can tell you for one thing. Uh, you heard simplicity, but supply chain starts with complexity from us. Why is it complex? Some skittle chart is what we call this, right? M&Ms. You can see the numbers. Uh, you know, this is what we call as the manufacturing supply chain. When you look at 40,000 employees, we are also counting people in the factory, by the way, and not just the planners or the commodity managers. And uh, we have uh, close to a million orders per year, four uh, million uh, square feet manufacturing that we have to manage, and uh, 10,000 suppliers. Actually, it's more than that. And uh, I think this is the laser, right? Okay. Yeah. So I just want to draw your attention. You saw the iron triangle this morning. This is somewhat similar to that. In the iron triangle, if you remember, service was in the middle. What, I don't know whether you can read this, what you see in the middle is optimization. Why is it out there? For Intel particularly, there are three things that we have to optimize. Customer, that's right there, you know, customer responsiveness, managing the customer, that's critical for us. And the second one is uh, Intel is a very asset-rich company. If you are going to walk into your fab, which is going to cost anywhere between $4 billion plus, 75% of that is equipment. So that means we are buying you know, billions of dollars of equipment, and how, how we plan for it, how we manage it, and how we leverage it is where the asset management comes into big picture. And then the inventory management, primarily how, you know, like how, what kind of a buffer we need to keep. How do we manage inventory? What's our planning? And uh, the inventory is not just from a product perspective, also from, you know, sourcing and uh, everything. So how we bring them all together, that's where the real analytics comes into play. And uh, this is something that I put together some time ago. It looks kind of busy, but... What is the role of analytics within the organization? 
And how do you connect it to supply chain was the question somebody asked me. I was, I was kind of thinking about it. Then I said, primarily, it is a, at the end of the day, it's a demand and supply. What you don't see is actually you know, how we do the demand and supply around our product right, to meet the customer needs. So when, when we have that kind of a balancing act, where does it begin and where does it end? It kind of is a seamless cycle. But when you look at it, the finance organization is really looking at, okay, what's our sales forecast? I mean, uh, primarily, what's our revenue projections? And how do we manage cost? So we kind of work with them from a revenue projections and also cost management. That's one of the analytics things. And then when you look at the sales and marketing, now we're looking at share of the market, total available market. You know, what's our campaign looks like? I mean, uh, uh, you know, what's the market intelligence talk, you know, like is looking at it. So those are all the different types of analytics. Some of them involve simple descriptive kind of analytics. Some of them could be more predictive and uh, you know, kind of looking at where is the market changing. And then, of course, once we know what product we're making, what the customer want, what the competition is out there, and then how we price it, how we release it, and all those things, then it kind of goes from the demand, from marketing to the demand. So that means now I, we need to be able to generate demand forecast. And you all know this, right? All forecasts are wrong, but some are useful. So that's why you know, we don't put a forecast out there and uh, hope and pray that that's what it's going to be. We're going to work with that. We're going to make some changes. We're going to make some surgical changes. That's why we have a long-term forecast. We have a mid-term forecast. And then, of course, we have an execution plan. So that's where we catch up. That's, where, that's why one of the reasons inventory is used as a buffer. I like the 3D printing. One of these days, I wish, that's my goal, right? When the supplier is sending an equipment, they also ship a 3D printer with it with instructions to make your spares so that I don't have to manage spares. It's not there yet, but I'm, I'm sure it's coming. And uh, so think of it that way, right? I mean, when we look at it, then the product flows into manufacturing, whether you outsource it, insource it, whatever you do, you still have to plan. You got to, if you have assembly operations, you got to plan for all the bill of materials. You got to work with the suppliers. You have to work within the factory, and then you have to make sure what the customer upside, downside, how they're going to be managing all these things through, you know, proper sequencing, inventory planning. That's where all the IT systems really help us. And then we kind of get into, okay, now how the product, you know, like equipments are moving, the products are going, so how do we manage that? What's the, what's our logistics, including transportation, warehouse, you know, like all the DC, all this stuff. So there's a lot of network optimization we apply. On the right-hand side, on the left-hand side, I kind of put it as, uh, you know, like it's more like a score model approach is what we're using. Plan, source, make, deliver, return. That's our guiding principle for analytics. On the right-hand side, I have three primary functions that we use, or uh, type of uh, technique that we use. Either we will be doing optimization, given that I have this much capacity and this much demand and I have this many constraints, what's my best feasible plan, build plan look like? So that's a big optimization, right? At the same time, we may have uh, a lot of uh, you know, statistics, data mining kind of things, what the market is telling me, uh, and uh, where, which product, when do I release it, and then kind of looking at forecasting, all those things, kind of bucket under statistics and data mining. And then, of course, there are some activities that it's kind of hard to put a mathematical model around it. You really have to kind of run a simulation, meaning what is the best network routing system that's going to work for me? If I were to add a distribution center somewhere else to ensure that the customer perfect order and uh, you know, responsiveness are met, what is the best way I can do that? So that means you can go do some what ifs. That means you gotta develop your, you know, you need to know your supply chain. And uh, what we have is a supply chain model, is an entire end-to-end -end supply chain model. Then we go and run it, of course it's validated and everything, and then we go and change things in it. What if we make some improvements here? What if we do something else? So that's how we look at our logistics, network design. And uh, we also have transportation models that look at, should I ship it? by ocean or by air. 
I think for our small products, AI always works out better, but when we look at a long term, when you're looking, shipping some other, you know, like our bill of materials and things like that, we may go for ocean. So there are different ways to look at it. It's not just the cost decision, it's also velocity and also serviceability, some of the things we look at. And this morning I was kind of, uh, when that uh, question came up, 51% I believe said cost. I'm like, oh my God. Okay, we gotta wake up. I know cost is important, supply chain is considered as a cost function, but more and more, supply chain is now considered as a profit-enabling body. As you can see, a lot of supply chain professionals are becoming CEOs, including our Brian Krasanich, who was the COO, supply chain was reporting to him. So that means you got to have your pulse on the product, on the market, and of course on the operations. And uh, kind of moving in there, you know, we also kind of support engineering from a new product introduction. A lot of, uh, we, are, we are working with uh, several of our product groups, particularly with the uh, Internet of Things, to really look at how our you know, data as service, what kind of analytics is going to go when we release this product. What, what are the different things we need to do, we can do, is some of the things we do with engineering. And then, of course, materials and equipment, the sourcing models we look at, and the procurement and the different types of uh, when do we procure it, including construction supply chain. So kind of sequencing it, planning it, and all those kind of things. So this is in, in a nutshell. I'm not even talking about manufacturing because manufacturing, we have a bigger group where we look at all our defectivity, our process control. But it all kind of feeds into the entire supply chain and it kind of gets into the underlying analytics. My last slide, and uh, so I just want to leave you with uh, some, uh, you know, uh, pointers so that you can ask us questions. And where are the opportunities for analytics really? Definitely analytics will continue to play a big role in understanding customer needs and changes. If I know what the customer want, my life is easy. But does the customer really know what they want? I'm sure they know what they need, but I don't know whether they, I know what they want. And lack of predictability is given, right? I mean, anything you know is going to change now or later. Sooner it's going to change. So how do we react to it? What kind of models, what kind of scenarios? In fact, this is where we have developed some Bayesian network models where we look at predictability of our supply chain from a risk, you know, risk and reliability perspective. And uh, growth, innovation, shifting to emerging markets. So this is where we do our, all kinds of market analysis. Where is our customer strategy you know, uh, from a market perspective? And how is our supplier ecosystem changing? So we do all types of different scenarios. Where do we need to spend the money? Where do we need to make sure that we, ha we have uh, you know, uh, supply chain risk mitigated? Things of that nature. And uh, we're also, uh, lo I think the IT is really emerging. We, we heard about SMAC, social, mobile, cloud, uh, analytics. The underlying thing really is data is exploding. We didn't know what to do with it in the past with limited computing. And now with, with computing uh, that has grown really well and the cost of computing has gone to pennies, we now have a way of collecting data it's not just enough, we need to convert that into useful, meaningful information and insight. And um, I think this is where we talk about, am I doing just dashboards, which is descriptive? Am I doing uh, predictive, where I can at least say what's going on? Or should I have a prescriptive approach? If this is gonna happen, this is what you need to do. And I'm gonna throw one thing out there, which is cognitive. I think with the machine-to-machine -machine learning and uh, people talk about singularity, I'm not gonna talk about it here, but uh, when, when they're aware, when they understand what is happening, imagine a machine that knows what it is capable of doing, when it is going to break down, what its like mind and machines are, what the demand and supply changes are, it can provide signal, it is connected to the hub. Imagine that kind of a situation, it tells you that, I know what's changing, I need to do this now, for example. We're not there yet, in some cases maybe we are, but at least I'm talking from my perspective. And 3D printing definitely is going to change the way we do our supply chain, but it's going to take some more thinking. Primarily, people talk about form, fit, function. I want to add the fourth one dimension called feel. Form, fit, function, feel. I think that's becoming more and more important for 
For example, why do you want to go stand in line and buy an iPhone 6? Functionally, you're going to get it from another smartphone. It's going to fit in your pocket. It's going to fit your needs. But there is another feel element that's going to change the way you think about it. How is your supply chain ready for it? And uh, I kind of threw, uh, mentioned integrated business planning. It's not about just demand and uh, uh, supply, but it's also about product, the overall picture of where the business is going. And uh, talked about collaboration visibility, and I think there are some companies out here that's their business, and I think it is really, really important. If you don't understand the supply chain in entirety and the visibility, then it's going to be harder. And uh, I'm going to leave with one last point, which is I already talked about profit, so talent. You know, you can have everything, but if you don't have the right talent, particularly in analytics in emerging markets, it is not going to work. In fact, I have a couple of openings I'm not able to fill because you want to fill with the right talent in this particular case. And it's not just good enough that you bring the right people. How do you, you know, make sure that their career is managed well? They are motivated, they're challenged. I call CRM as more like TRM from my perspective. Talent, uh, you know, like it's, it's not customer relations management internally, it's the talent relations management for me. Some of the things that work for one person may not work for the other. So we need to understand and promote and make sure that you know, like the talent is nurtured and motivated. With that, I'm going to stop. And pass the mic. Okay. Um, so, Manny, as Stephen gets up and moves the slide, tell the group where you report and how many folks you have in your analytics group. Just give some perspective. Uh, I report into a uh, couple of VPs, actually, because uh, the way it is set up is uh, I support the supply chain organization, either it's a product or a sourcing or forecasting. So with that, I, I report into uh, VP of uh, our global supply management. They're two in a box, and they're responsible for all the sourcing, which is in terms of several billions of dollars. I also have the responsibility of supporting my team. is the responsibility of supporting our product planning, inventory, and I have a team of 15, but we work with embedded analytics people. We develop the solutions, we work with them, and then we transfer it over to the team, and that becomes part of the systems. And when they come to us for projects, we also talk about, do we have a good objective? Does it link to the strategic objectives? And uh, does it, do we have a business process in place? And do we have systems and tools to support it, and people with the right support? And then we can think about analytics. So. Okay, so there are many people in the audience that are like jealous, right, getting that kind of support for analytics. So we're going to ask you to sit down and we're going to come back and we're going to chat about that. Yeah. Now, Stephen, I actually started talking to you about concurrent optimization and design and some of the work that you've been doing. Why don't you share your story? So if you want to just I, go ahead. I will with a, um, a little side note, though. I'll, I'll take this off in a second. Okay, I but, like um, in the hat. So. But this, this, uh, so, so this, uh, you should know, is a Green Bay Packers hat. Oh, okay. It, 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 I, don't know if, I don't know if Dave's in the audience. I know we have some, some uh, members from uh, University of Wisconsin here, and, I, and there, was, there was a number of hands that went up. <laughs> but, um, you should get your Cardinals hat. <laughs> but the, I guess the point here is that after our performance last Thursday, with me wearing the hat, with Dave showing the picture of all the, all the Packer memorabilia, the, the way to typify a Packers fan is resilient. So, <laughs> so, so, That's um, pretty good. So what I'd like to do today is, is go through um, maybe from a little different perspective that Manny did, so it's, it's good. You, you, you see a lot of the areas that, that he touched at, and those things apply to us also. But talk about Schneider Electric, where, where we're at, looking at where we're going with advanced analytics of Schneider Electric, and then looking at where we, at, where I feel are, are very exciting opportunities, and then finally talking about the organization there. Um, and on the organization side, you'll see two different perspectives. So my group is brand new. We've been there for about a year. Uh, some people have been there, you know, all, all of uh, a month or so. We share a lot of the same things. But I'm starting off, uh, Manu's been there for about 15 years, building, bu building your team up. So as you ask questions, you get, you get both perspectives and maybe more wisdom on that side. For the corporate side, I've spent about 15 years myself playing analytics on the corporate side and another 22 playing analytics on the consulting side. 
So it's been around a while, but, but it's the, it's both sides that, that, that I think you need to focus on. And as Annie, as Manny will say, when we, you know, we, we are really consultants internally to the, to, to the, to the company. So this is, uh, so this is Schneider Electric. Uh, we were founded in 1836, uh, so we were, uh, founded way, way before, uh, Intel. We have 170,000 employees, uh, more than Intel, uh, does. We operate in 120 countries, also more than Intel, but unfortunately we don't make nearly as much money. So, uh. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe you can give us some insight there. Yeah. <laughs> however, however, as, as of about, uh, 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 12, 13 years ago, we were about, about a third of the size in, um, as, a, as a company. So we had 70,000 employees, about 20, 12 billion in sales, so lots and lots of acquisitions. The acquisitions then, and, and, you, and I guess this goes a little bit more about why I'm up here and why they needed to hire me uh, and, and get my group in place, is that with those acquisitions, um, which, you know, is fantastic for the, uh, for the company in terms of the margin that they're getting and, and receiving in our, in our products, um, we also ha have inherited 107 ERP systems, for, you, for those of you that deal with ERP systems. We have 248 plants. We have 107 major DC centers, and we know that we stock product in at least 900 locations across the, across the globe. So it's a, it's it's a very very extensive uh, piece of pie that now we're looking at uh, in organization wise, taking what were different parts of the company, and over the last three years putting them into one in one supply chain organization. And so we'll talk about that a little bit on the next slide. But the products and markets are about 500,000 SKUs. Uh, that, that are out there. Uh, we service really high-tech products and industrial products. So if you build, build a building, if you wanted to recreate the World Trade Center, you can go back to Schneider Electric, and we could give you everything to, uh, to support the building of the product from an electrical uh, viewpoint. Service a lot of utility companies, a lot of industry, a lot of uh, production manufacturing uh, plants, so we can we can provide the things to make to make that work, and also have some very very good technology to take your electrical bill. And if you do things right and utilize some of our products, can really significantly reduce the uh, the electricity bill that, that that goes into it. So 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 that is Schneider Electric. Uh, at Schneider Electric, though, our my mission uh, that I was brought into is to really optimize the global supply chain. So, so we're really not now, I guess my mission, not my real mission, my mission, my boss boss, but, um, uh, but we, we're, we're looking at procurement, manufacturing, and logistics. And, and we're, we're, we're really looking at a high focus on service to our customer. And, and we have to measure and understand the cost of that service to the customer. So how high is, is high enough? Um, but, but, but then also look at it from the other side of the supply chain looking at intersecting supply chains with our suppliers. So looking on both, both, both sides of that. As I just said, we, uh, we, we established our team uh, just last year. Uh, so we have core analytics tools that we'll talk about on the next slide and, a, uh, and an organization in place to begin the, uh, begin the journey where we're, where we're, we're divided both into a global team and then regional teams across the world. So the, the, the first focus of our group is to give a logistics network strategy by region. And as we, as we went out and, and looked at the data, I guess I can call it data, it's hard to tell if that was data or not, but as we looked at this mass volume of, 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 of numbers, um, the one thing that we found out is that the internal groups out there really didn't have a good idea of what they were selling or how much they were selling or the characteristics of the products. It was, it was amazing. So the first thing was just visualizing what was going on uh, and, and for them to understand that the next thing is going on to optimizing it and then finally going and taking the tools that we have and help implement it and, and give direction to the, to the implementation. Um, exciting opportunities. And then stepping back a little bit, what, what we found also is that as we began this journey, as they looked at an organization where, where, where we looked at uh, uh, doing, going across, the, um, across the, the platform of Schneider Electric. We had, I think, about 800 or so different suppliers for transportation across the world. 
we had we had lots and lots of different different things that we said you know we need to take a step back we put in lead transportation uh, and logistics providers across the globe and this gives us a, a couple things to start with as we organize internally to provide those services ourselves we're also looking at digitation of flows so, so getting uh, GT Nexus in uh, utilizing some of their software to take all of these 107 uh, ERPs take the information from our carriers put it in one place where now my team has a has a has a chance to do something with it uh, and then we're also building our own internal ones and then and then taking then now that we have a base now that we have some data now that we're cutting a lot of our, our costs and, and working with that then, then looking at some key tools and and you know just just plain Microsoft access and, and SQL server so everybody on my teams you know has very very high skills in those areas can get to large large data um, you know the 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 lightweight computers that that were the regular issue at uh, at Schneider Electric which the first day that I was on the job the guy that that I inherited said you know my computer crashed four times yesterday and um, <clears throat> trying to process the the, the data that, that that he was trying to do so we now uh, have invested in a lot of Bell uh, computers that are about two or three times as heavy um, one of the issues that we do is a roller bag because they're hard to carry around, mm -hmm. but but everybody is happier uh, when they're when they're sitting down and, and doing things with them. Um, we look at the, uh, we, and we've installed throughout uh, the, our group Tableau and and it's been nine, you know the, the people now are getting dashboards, they're getting things of how their business is doing and just understanding what's going on was a tremendous uh, help in, in in our group there. We looked at uh, uh, network design, so we uh, we did some pilots with some other groups uh, with some other tools that showed some very very good savings. Decided to take the function in house, and and then ended up going with LamaSoft for the supply chain guru, which does things which we'll talk about in, in a second in terms of network design, simulation, inventory control, routing, and then and then and then also are doing some work with some some statistical analysis software. So the, the areas that we're, that we're working at, that area in green right there, that is as far as I'm supposed to go. So, <laughs> so, so, so we, start, we start at the end of the plants, we, we go down to the DCs, and as Manny talked about, where there's three vice presidents that he reports to, well, I report to one senior vice president, and the executive vice president is kind of saying, you're going to use these guys, but maybe not, you don't have to do it right now. So there's, there's a lot of politics going on, and, and, and I think rightfully so, but we're trying to prove the technology of, of what can happen and how you can use this technology, and at some point we will, we will start bran branching out. So, so right now, looking at, at DCs, understanding the network design, and understanding kind of uh, um, secondhand the, the, the inventory considerations in that. But then that we will, up, uh, in a little bit, look at, look at it more upstream, to understanding the suppliers, the purchasing behaviors, the plants, manufacturing the plants, so the full, full stream there. And then also looking at the customers saying, you know, are, is there price elasticity? And, and is there something that in terms of if we had to get better service, do we get, do we get more demand? And, and, and that's things that we want to look at both sides. And again, something that I'm, I'm not sure I really want to participate in just because it's going to create more work for me, but merger and, and, and acquisition <laughs> analysis. That we're in it big time. The, the, the company is targeting growing over the next 10 years or so to about twice the size that we're at now. So, uh, you know, my, my world, uh, for, fortunately, you know, hopefully I'll have enough gray hairs to uh, retire before that happens, but you never know. So, the organization uh, is, is there's an uh, executive vice president of a uh, global supply chain. So, Annette Clayton from Dell was brought in about three years ago. Uh, she heads up that team, uh, brought in uh, my boss, who's the senior vice president of, uh, of the logistics and network, uh, network design. Our, so, so I have, you know, visibility right up to the top. I'm, there's a memo that I just answered that was sent off to, uh, to Annette regarding some tools that we may be doing uh, in, in inventory um, control in the future. My group then is, is I, I have two teams. And so because I have two teams, I also in 10 months became a diamond member in Delta. Um, <laughs> so, uh, 
So I have a, uh, I have a team based in Atlanta. Uh, so we've uh, three people there. I have a team in Singapore, which we need to hire a third person for. And like Manny says, it is not easy. Um, get, getting people of the, of the talent and caliber that we want. And, and, um, and, then, and then we have people, there's five people right now within Schneider, and that number is going to grow. But they report in to the, uh, the, they're called regional teams. They report into the local uh, people there. And we give them very heavy-handed support, are talking to them all the time. But the North American team, the Atlanta t t team, my, my team, supports North America and South America. Europe, Middle East, and Africa are shared between, between my team. In fact, on a project that we're doing in Europe now, there's a, there's a girl from my team and a guy from Singapore that are, that, that are working on that. And then East Asia, uh, Pacific, and India are, gonna, are handled by, by the group in Singapore. So starting off right now with a budget for seven people that I found six, um, and then getting up to maybe uh, maybe ten people or so, but with people in the uh, in the background. Um, so again, looking at the uh, 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 global team background, really looking for people, and because we're we're tasked with doing this stuff in, in such a, a fast pace. Looking for people that are that, that have some very very good education and 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 business understanding. So at some point when we when we grow to to a to a little bit of a bigger bigger size, we'll start recruiting uh, out of the area. We have Georgia Tech right in the background, which is a fantastic fantastic role for for us. But right now, uh, you know, um, my, my prerogative is to really go get people with at least five to ten years of experience. Some people we have 20, 25 years of experience. Um, the the um, lowest rank on my team is a manager, and it goes all the way up to a director reporting to me that has ha, that has no direct reports. But to get the talent out of consulting firms, that, that that's what I have to pay, and for the payback that that, that we see, um, it's it, it's worth it. So is that my last slide? And it yeah, is. let's have a seat. So I've got a couple of questions, and then. If folks have questions for the team, I picked two folks that are very different places in their journey. So Stephen, who's starting out with his analytics team and really building network design, and Manny, you've been at this for a long time. Let's talk about talents, you know. How do you go get this talent? And, you know, what do you look for, Stephen? Yeah, so um, uh, an advantage I had is, uh, is I just came immediately from the Home Depot where uh, they had a lot and a lot of people from Georgia Tech. So um, my, my first thing was poaching two people from the Home Depot. Uh, <laughs> You're not so, poaching from these organizations not, today, are you? I, I, I would like to. <laughs> so, uh, so, 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 so and, and, and also from the years that I had, so, so, so I spent 20 years out at, out at MIT, so, so I have a pool of people that, that, that I know in, in this area. So that helps a lot. But it's a combination of, you know, the experience do, doing this and, and some, of the other, some of the other attributes. You really have to be a consultant. You have to like people. You have to be, be very communicative with, and especially in an environment that people have no idea what you're doing. <laughs> so, 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 I guess, I guess, to, to all you guys, you know what modeling is. I, I came came in from Sao Paulo on Saturday. Um, you know, the guy, the, the guy at, uh, and I told this to a couple people already, but the guy at the um, uh, um, when you come in at the customs, customs. That's yeah. it. I, I knew there was a word for that. So, 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 so the guy, a guy at the customs came in and asked, you know, is here for business? Yes. What were you doing? Oh, I was doing modeling for Schneider Electric. And he looked at me, and I know and, and, and the first thing, this guy does not look like Angelina Jolie. <laughs> and, 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 and so he just shook, shook his head, and, and I went on. And you, went, was, you got the stamp. So, Manny, how about yourself? Any insights? Oh, I have from Home Depot also. <laughs> <laughs> Do you no, mind to tell the story you were telling with Dr. Runger earlier? Absolutely. I, I think we need to see it way ahead of time because uh, Intel sells itself and people want to come work for Intel. And uh, so the question is what type of people we want? And there are different opportunities. Number one, uh, we make sure that they understand what's at stake. 
what kind of company it is, what type of culture, because if the culture doesn't sell, nothing sells. And then we also selectively look at who is the best fit, both ways. And uh, what we do is bring the right candidates as interns. And our goal is to, by the time they're done with summer internship, which normally is a three month, between two, three months, uh, we have an offer for them. In fact, we just made an offer for a PhD student who's going to graduate, younger uh, student who's going to graduate only in 2016. Two but years we already from now, made yeah. an offer, and the, I, I, I believe he accepted. He's going to come back as an intern next year. So we, we, we know that he is one yeah. of the best we got to hire. That's one of the things. We also engage with universities, and uh, we do research. And as part of that, we already know who the potential candidates, you know, the stars are. And uh, we work with them even before they graduate. And some of our uh, folks, including myself, we are adjunct uh, faculties, so we have access and we understand the way the university works, what it takes for the students. And so those are all the things we look for. And once we hire them, we also want to understand what their skill matrix is, you know, what they want to do. Leave me alone, I want to stay in my cube, I want to do that. Some people prefer that. Others, hey, I want to be a social butterfly. So we want to make sure that the job fits the need. If not, we're not doing service to any one of us. And typically, we look for an engineering kind of a graduate because analytics is really strong in that space. Either it's industrial engineering, for that matter, and then an MBA because that gives them the business acumen. If you don't ask the right questions, don't even bother developing models or solutions yeah. for it. And a couple of years of experience really helps because they know how to operate in an industrial culture. So those are the kind of things we look for. So I hear networking, Stephen. I hear the internship and then aggressive offers. How do you have the right culture that they feel loved after they get in the organization? Because I see a lot of churn in analytics jobs and a lot of people that are trying to pull talent from you. You know, how do you create that right culture, Stephen? And, and, and a lot of that has to deal with, I guess, understanding the needs of these, I, I, I guess, a, a, a very high quality analyst that really has a lot to contribute, but um, uh, also is interested in the te technical side, but then also looking at a management career potentially down, down, down the road. And, and again, it, it depends on the person, and it's understanding what they need, what their goals are. And in this area, again, I'm just starting out, Manny's about twice the size that I, that I have now. But you know, at the point that we get you know, too, too many size, it makes it easier to, to then allow people to, to pin uh, mm -hmm. in, in, their, in, their, in their different areas. Mm -hmm. My impression is this is a lot like an artist colony, that good modelers want to be with good modelers. I'm not talking about Angelina Jolie, <laughs> but people that are really analytic. Do you, do you find that? Oh, yeah. yeah. I, 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 I think you really do. I think you're right. I mean, maybe people prefer to stay with Angelina Jolie, but <laughs> a true analyst would like to be challenged. Uh -huh. yeah. would the, some of the challenges they run into is, I don't have the data. I don't think my customer stakeholder understands what the solution is. So that's where trying to connect, trying to make sure, have them have a big picture, mm -hmm. and how what they do connects to the strategic objectives. Those are all the critical things. Mm -hmm. And then having a critical mass is really, really important because if they're left by themselves, they're going to be frustrated pretty soon. Right, right. and then so. somebody else is going to steal them, yeah. right? So, 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 so I think it's a matter of really being able to support them, but they also truly look at how best do, do they grow, what do they want to get into, and, and give them the structure to be successful. So, I mean. What questions do you have? So uh, we've got some mics, if we can run some mics here. This is another Wisconsin guy. I'm going to tell you, warn you right ahead of time, you know, that he may ask you that question about Same resiliency. Guy. Yeah, the Green Bay, the Green Bay guy. Uh, wow, I've got a bunch of questions about this, so I'll just keep it so to two. Yeah. Okay, two, 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 two that be are, quick. Two that are unrelated. One, um, is it possible? So it seems that having somebody with knowledge of the business would be very, very useful. And you mentioned that um, having an MBA would be useful, a couple of years of experience, but it seems like having somebody with 10 or 12 years of experience in the business would be more useful. Can you take somebody uh, in, in are the tools of analytics such that you can teach somebody how to do it that's been in the business for 10 or 12 years that doesn't come from it? And then secondly, and then I'll give up the microphone, do um, you find that people internal to the organizations that you're both associated with know about the 
the questions to ask that can be addressed with analytics. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay, let's take them one at a time. Can you teach them? Can you train them in-house, Steve? I think you can, but only to a point. So you have to understand what you're, you're looking for in that person. I mean, I, I, I guess it goes back to the, some of the days at the Home Depot where we had you know, th th those type of tools. And the ones that I showed, every one of those tools you, you really can understand and, and know. There's a level above that that, that I, I brought in Mathematica when I was at, at the Home Depot, and some of that was just over the, 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 the level. So, I mean, it's you have to really be careful. And that, so Mathematica was a wonderful tool. You could do all sorts of other stuff, but it what didn't match where we were at at, at that point with, with, with a group of people. So, so you really have to be careful. Now, the, the tools that, that, that I put up there, that's light years ahead of what Schneider is using anyway. So, I mean, I, I can definitely rec re retire on that. But, um, uh, but, but and on Manny's side and the people that he's bringing in, I would imagine you are already using you know, some, of, some of those tools. We have like a that. combination of internal and external. We try to go by the ideal candidate, but we know that that's not always the case. The answer really is it depends on the individual. If the individual really wants to go, in fact, one of the uh, successful, uh, we call him data scientists now, he did not have analytics background, but he really wanted to learn, so he went to school, he did his master's in business analytics, and he's one of our leading guys. He came from a completely different background, but his drive to get there and his business knowledge really helped because he knew how the whole thing works. Yeah, yeah. but he reskilled himself. He right? reskilled himself. And I think one of the issues is people think they can just take somebody out of a normal job and kind of plug them in. And I think it requires a real love of data and analytics, Absolutely. right? I, I think these guys yeah. have just got to really eat it for breakfast, you know? It's, uh, exactly. I think it's important, right? They do. Yeah. They do. All right, now let's take the second question. Do you remember the second question? I forgot. <laughs> yeah, so how do you support the business and how do you help them to understand the tools? Because one of the issues I'm asked a lot is design. What does that mean and how do I go about it and is it really valuable? Yeah, so, so, so we're, we're doing a lot of stuff internally so, so, uh, so, so I, I've, I've given some webinars on what network modeling is. So we got it down to a, a 20 minute spiel, and now we're, we're making that as a, as available online course that, in fact, that is the most desired course at, the, at, uh, Schneider Electric, is just understanding what this network modeling type, uh, type, type piece is. And then we're also going to do like a half a day session for, uh, managers, if they can go, go, go to that. And then a two to three day session for people that are actually getting into the area, want to know a lot more, but are actually going to be working there. So besides just our group, you have, um, you have people that are in the regions that are coming in, and, and some of the region people don't have any of the modeling experience, they have some of the business experience, but they are good in terms of data collection, data processing, whatever, and, and, and but, but we're wondering in some cases, how far they can go running some of the models, because if they don't have that experience, it's it's too much of a it, too much of a jump for them to go from nothing to being responsible for these things, especially when you can make little little mistakes and mess up everything and, and get really embarrassed big, quick. Big consequences, so. yeah. Manny, what do you think? How do you really I, I think the it is managers? it's a matter of uh, you know working together because the managers clearly understand the operational and financial metrics but they don't really care to start with how you get there they say i need to reduce my cost by 20 percent on this network so we present them with options and we don't we don't share with them the gory simulation we do but we tell them hey we are using a simulation tool we'll be happy to share with you the details and of course some of the analysts in the group they come around they want to know because we are not equipped with 15 people to maintain and sustain it, so we look for handoff. But we initially want to understand what are the things you want to do. I want to improve my cost or velocity or serviceability at a minimum, and by how much, and what area. So there's a lot of business knowledge and insight that they have that we want to learn first, because it may be low-hanging fruit to start with. And then we go put that into you know like a model, and we go back and share with them. We kind of work with them to show that this is how it's going to be and these are the different scenarios you're going to come up with. By the way, we also looked at some of the things you could do. So first get them to, we kind of use a crawl, walk, run. Get them to go along 
and then get them to walk with you, and then maybe we can run yeah, but, tomorrow. Right? Yeah, but, but, but it's, it's, very, it's, it's very much as Vanny said, and it's almost like a typical consulting engagement. I mean, when, we, when we go in and, and go, go to, like, like the last one was, uh, was Europe, we have a deck that says, you know, this is, this is the process that we're going through. These are what you're going to do. This is what we did in other parts of, of Schneider. So trying to explain the whole process. And you know, it's it's very similar to to what I used to do when you're on know, as a chainalytics or, or other places where you go in and and you have a kickoff. It's 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 a kickoff. It's a very similar process. process. So if you had one piece of advice for the people in the audience, right? I think there was a question. Oh, there. one more question. Okay. Okay. Well, that's good. Hostway, we've got two questions. Hostway. How do you manage the balance? Okay. How, how, what do you mean, Hostway? Um, when when you go work a project in Europe in the analytics, you might be requested to do a project from manufacturing who's looking for throughput, low cost. How do you manage the balance that we talk about between capital cost service and the whole analytics? And the metrics. How do you manage the balance and the oh, metrics? I can go on that one first. Uh, we have a representation. We call it as a management review committee, so representing those groups as part of our decision making. And then we also have a project intake process, which clearly indicates this is our, it's almost like what's the voice of the customer? What does the customer want? And what's the voice of the process, which is capacity? Kind of a supply, line, uh, supply chain thinking, right? And then we would look at prioritizing, if we were to do this six months uh, or three months out, what and how the success will look like and what's the ROI or ROIC it's gonna be. And then we have a weighted process, and then that's how we prioritize and we engage. And some, some of the projects don't get done because of uh, limited bandwidth, but that's the process we use. But don't you think this governance question is really important, you know, in terms of, you know, how you actually put the glue together to glue it to the business? Yeah, yeah it, 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 it's extremely important. Uh, and especially when you have different groups that you present different alternatives, and some group can't make their bonus for the year. if. You, you go about and, and, and do that. So I mean, it's it's very important that you look at the the different scenarios or so that that that, that can be in place. And what's the good thing about the analytics side is that you have a whole wealth of information in terms of different costs and competing costs and what services provided and whatnot. And so you know, in, in China there was a there was a move toward from you know storing product at a plant or next to a plant, which is what they were doing, to then storing it locally. We got much lower transportation costs. We got much better service. Seemed like the right thing to do. But guess what? Inventory goes up, and the vice president that had, had the inventory did not like that at all. So you, you have to go through, understand the whole process, and then have an ex executive enough process that he gets, he gets new, new, new bonuses or targets set, and then everybody's happy. But so, you got to have that review. But you have to have that yeah. review, and it has to be at a high enough level where you align the organization. If you, if you don't align the organization, you're, you're not going anywhere. Okay, we have a question here on the front row. Let's have a mic. Yeah, thanks, Abby. Hi, I'm Laura Asiel. I'm with Pixera Global. But I think you already started to answer that because as um, you all were talking about it today, I thought this is really the, the information and the intellectual capability here. But sometimes data is an insight. And sometimes data doesn't always drive behavior. And that's, you know, mm -hmm. when you talked yeah. about how do you glue it to the organization, and, and we've had other people talk about leadership here today. And I just wondered if you could give us some insight into transitioning from an IQ to an EQ and, and the leadership that has to happen to make that that come to fruition. Yeah, some of my experiences, some of these analytic guys don't have the best EQ, Manny. Uh, you, know, uh, you know, how do you help them to uh, be able to relate? I mean, some of these guys are so brilliant, you know, that, uh, you know, relating and communicating to the business. Any insight here? You want to take that first? <laughs> <laughs> that was EQ. <laughs> there, there we go. No, I mean, that, 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 that is a big piece of it. I, again, we chose to, to get people with with business experience and also people that were very communicative c coming in, um, but you're right. Not all the people will have that, and 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 you know some of the people that you know I got inherited with don't potentially have that that that, that same. Um, so so it, they have to be channeled in an area where they can contribute, be be, be very beneficial to the, to the group, and potentially not step on other people's toes. 
So there, there, there is a lot, and especially in, in Schneider, where this is brand new, um, you have a executive vice president coming in from the outside, and she has lots of people that are worried about what we're doing. And, and you know, we, as, as we go out, you know, initially I talked about, you know, to, you know, doing doing things in the plants or whatever, and you know, you, you don't talk about that. This is this is not what um, people want to to do now. So it's, so it's it's a um, you have to be savvy on the on the IQ and the EQ. I think that's a big big piece of it, and you channel the people that have that in order to be the upfront people. So there's there's people that are some I guess lead consultants that know the technology side, but also know the business and and know how to communicate and, and present things in a win-win type of, type of way. So that's a great answer, so I'm going to add a couple of things. One is setting the tone. We talked about leadership, right? So if the, if the leaders of the organization trust in data-based decision-making, that provides a lot of uh, you know, confidence in the data scientist to go, you know, it makes sense for me to go do this. The second one is the you have to earn the credibility and trust of your stakeholders. If you don't have that, forget it. You may have the best solution out there, but they may not go for it. And the credibility comes with, you know, over time. That's something. And the third thing we do is knowing that this person is a great PhD optimization, but if I put him in front of the customers, he's going to... I don't yeah. want to use the word, but anyway, yes. so yes. We <laughs> normally, yeah. normally we would make sure that we pair that person with the business analyst, okay. the person yeah. who understands it. And in fact, we have uh, uh, what we call as the liaisons. They work with the business. They understand what their you know, points are, what their things that they want to go improve, what are the top three priorities, and then they look at how do we go about doing that. So that's where we bring our analyst in the solution space and uh, we, that's an area where I'm trying to grow them also because you don't want to be in your silo. If you want to be really successful, think of yourself as a consultant is how we look at it. Well, any last words of advice for the group? Do it. Go so, do it. Yeah. Awesome. I like that. Do it. Thank you so much. I really appreciate Thank it. You. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you very much.